Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, start our second session now. Um, you know, time is at a premium, so we can't really afford any delays. Uh, can I ask the brothers who are having a lovely chat there in the back just to sit down because we're going to start our session? Please close the doors at the back if uh, you can. Uh, those who want to carry on having teas and coffees, they can do. So, this is now our second session, uh, which is entitled, Where is Syria Heading? Decoding the Future of Syria and the Region, and What Should the International Community Do? Um, now, this session is starting 10 minutes later than planned. It's due to go on till 9.30. Uh, we'll allow it to go on to 9.35, uh, just to make up some of the lost time. But as I said, after that there will be some time up until 10 o'clock where people can ask the panellists maybe questions individually. Um, if they're prepared to uh, stay around till 10 o'clock, that is, I'm not going to impose that on them. Um, but also, just a reminder again about the etiquettes. Um, these are the expert panellists, they're here to um, speak and people are here to listen to them. Um, keep your questions brief and keep them asked questions. And if you disagree, then if you have an opportunity to raise your hand and the chair asks you to speak, you can ask a question and disagree with the speakers, but that's the, the way to do it. Otherwise, if everyone stands up and decides that they want to have their opinion heard by everybody over everybody else, it's not really going to work. So, without any further ado, I'll ask Christian to take on the second session. Thank you. Thank you. Continue as I've told. Okay, so uh, the next panel, is, as, as we just said, where is Syria heading? A huge area, obviously. And again, another uh, expert panel. And I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be uh, speaking. And they've got up to, up to, no more, up to 15 minutes or so. Uh, Dr. Christopher Phillips is a senior lecturer at Queen Mary University of London. He's also an associate uh, fellow at uh, Chatham House, uh, a, a world world renowned specialist um, in contemporary Syria and Jordan. He's lived in Syria uh, himself and con uh, conducts regular research trips uh, to the, re uh, to the um, uh, region. And his first book, Everyday Arab Identity, will be uh, actually is already out, isn't it? Right. Uh, right, um, Dr. James Patson will be speaking next. He's a professor of politics at the University of uh, uh, Manchester. He'll be speaking about a um, very interesting, very controversial area as well, responsibility uh, to protect. Uh, and uh, his research uh, areas currently lie within humanitarian intervention, uh, R2P, the use of private military and security companies, uh, fascinating area, and just war theory and alternatives to uh, war. And our final speaker uh, on the panel will be uh, Anas al Abda, who's a member of the political committee of the Syrian National Coalition. Uh, and he'll be talking about ways to find a sustainable solution uh, to the Syrian conflict, something I'm, I'm sure all of us uh, want to see happen. Uh, born in Damascus, uh, he's the founder of the Justice and Building Movement in the UK, the opposition group, uh, and he's also the head of the Damascus Declaration Group uh, in the diaspora. Uh, he's co-founder of the Syrian National Council, uh, also a member of the General Secretariat of the SNC, and he's recently uh, joined the Syria Coalition and, as I said, part of their uh, political uh, committee. So moving swiftly along, uh, Chris, you're going to be uh, speaking first. You can speak there or you can speak on the... On the... Uh, I'll speak here if that's okay. Yeah. Here no, right. right. Um, thanks very much, and, um, and thanks once again, uh, uh, Echo, for the... the thoughts of the first panelist. Thanks ever so much for inviting me uh, to this wonderful building uh, and to discuss this topic. Now, uh, I'm going to mainly be talking about uh, the regional side of the Syria uh, conflict. And the main argument I want to put across is that whilst we can all agree that it's the Assad regime that started uh, this war and this conflict, it's very important to note how the regional system and the regional actors have shaped and indeed I would say prolonged that conflict. And therefore, in order to move towards a solution to the, the civil war, we need to understand uh, the regional players and the international dimensions of the war as well. Now how I'm going to talk about that is I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to start first of all talking about the regional context 
in which this war broke out. I'm then going to talk about how that context shaped the course of the conflict. And then finally, in my last few sort of sentences, I'll talk about where we go now, moving back to sort of the central theme of this panel. So on this first issue of the regional context, uh, I think actually um, Asim was absolutely right in the first panel to say that we are very much seeing the consequences today of the world created by the 2003 Iraq War. And I can't really emphasize that point enough. And I think there were four particular changes to the, the Middle East region that came about as a consequence of that war that have really impacted upon Syria. And one in particular that perhaps people wouldn't agree with, but I, I would make this case, stands out as the most important consequences of those war. And that is that the, the Iraq war, not just the 2003 invasion, but the consequences of it, changed the position of the United States in the Middle East region. What do I mean by that? Well, prior to uh, the Iraq War 2003, from about 1991, from the first Gulf War, until I would say 2009 or possibly 2011, depending on when you date it, the United States was perceived as a hegemonic force in the Middle East, both by its allies and by its enemies. It was seen as the dominant force in the region. And this was a position that uh, you know, its allies believed that it was strong and that it, that it could intervene in the region and do things. Um, it, uh, its enemies were afraid of what it could do in the region. And this was a position that was perpetuated by regional leaders, by regional media, by the, the, the regional voices on the street, this idea we hear a lot, America's behind everything, that kind of idea. And indeed it was reinforced by the United States itself by their statements about their aspirations, what they aim to do in the region, and uh, uh, some of their actions as well, going all the way up to the 2011 intervention in Libya. Now, the reason I say that was perceived is that actually in reality, the United States was not as powerful as it believed, and indeed uh, people in the region believed it was. And this was seen very clearly in the 2003 Iraq war. It was not able to get the result it wanted. It, pushed money and weaponry and men on the ground into the Iraq conflict and it did not get the aims it wanted in that conflict. And indeed, effectively, when the United States withdrew from Iraq in 2011, it was a defeat. And what that has meant is that we've seen quite clearly a shift in approach from the United States towards the Middle East. This has come about partly as a result of war exhaustion from the Iraq war, the realisation it's called its bluff, it's not able to get what it wants, the economic crisis has made it, you know, comparatively weaker. Importantly, at home, there is war weariness. There is an absolute unwillingness to, to perpetuate any conflicts in the Middle East, and certainly not a boots-on-the-ground issue. And, of course, there are the politics of the President, Barack Obama, who very much came to power with an agenda of getting out of the Middle East and focusing on the domestic um, politics. He did not want to get involved. But interestingly, those years of United States dominance actually created a paradox in the region, whereby the United States allies, so Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Gulf states, Turkey, and so on, came to expect the United States to do things. They came to expect the United States to uh, act in their interests and to act as a hegemon over the region. And, interestingly, as did the populations as well. There was this sense the United States was behind everything and therefore was a very powerful actor that could do things. What this led to, on a state level, was uh, a lot of the, the regional players, the regional allies, particularly Turkey, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, did not develop their foreign policy capacities as well as a truly independent state would without having that sort of big brother to protect you. So you don't have uh, the development of really, of really sophisticated Ministry of Foreign Affairs in places like Turkey and uh, Saudi and Qatar that really has a deep intelligence network and understanding of the Middle Eastern region. Instead, what you get are people with a lot of personal ties based on personal experiences, perhaps tribal relations and so on, but not the kind of level of sophistication that you see actually from countries like Britain, France and the United States that developed <laughs> over time. To give an example of this, in 2011, when the Arab Spring broke out, Turkey only employed nine Arabic speakers in its Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is the same number that the British employed in its Tripoli uh, embassy alone in Libya. That's just to put things in context of the lack of sophistication in uh, the, 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 the foreign policy capacity of those states. But at the same time, 
what happened was, as the United States reeled from what was effectively a defeat in Iraq and didn't want to be as involved in the, United, in, in the Middle East, particularly in the Levantine region where it had been before, it created a vacuum. You know, there had been this hegemonic power, and other states in the region in particular sought to fill that vacuum. Turkey had regional ambitions, Qatar had regional ambitions, Iran already had regional ambitions, and Saudi, in an attempt to counter Iran, also had regional ambitions. So what you saw was other states seeking to uh, exploit that vacuum. But they didn't have the capacity to do so, so they didn't have to develop. So you, got, you get a phenomenon which really affects the, 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 the Syria conflict, which is many of these states get eyes bigger than their stomachs. They want to do a lot more than they are capable of actually achieving. And that's a consequence of a shift in the United States approach to the region. Another consequence, which is sort of a, minor, a minor point that, that came about because of the Iraq war as well, was uh, uh, a perception as the United States was moving out of the region that Russia, which had been sort of on the back foot in the 1990s in the region, became more emboldened to take a, a leading role. Actually, not as much as some of the sort of more paranoid voices would, would, would have you, they really just focused heavily on their old spheres of influence, which was Turkey, sorry, which, which was Syria, which was a, a hangover from its Cold War era. But it was willing to be a more active player on the regional stage in the Middle East. Now, three other factors that I'm going to really rattle through also occurred as a consequence of the Iraq war, which play into the Syria conflict. Firstly, you see the rivalry between Iran and Saudi really become more pronounced. It's existed ever since the 1979 Iranian Revolution, but until 2003, Saddam Hussein's Iraq had acted as a, an effective block on Iranian influence in the region. Once that was gone, the uh, Iranians were able to be far more influential over Iraq, and not only were Saudi afraid of that, but they also perceived that uh, Iraq had gone over into the Iranian camp as such. And therefore, when the Syrian war um, broke out, it saw an opportunity for a bit of recompense, uh, trying to bring Syria from the Iranian camp into the, the, the Saudi camp. So that's an important factor. The, a, a third factor from the Iraq war was the growth of regional sectarianism. It did exist beforehand, we shouldn't pretend that it didn't, but it was nowhere near as pronounced. And the levels of media coverage uh, on the, in the region covering supposed sort of, you know, uh, Sunni Shia clashes in Iraq were projected over the region. Though I would add, and it's an important caveat to, to make, whilst political leaders in the 2000s after the Iraq war were making a big point about sectarianism, especially, uh, you know, you get examples like King Abdullah of Jordan talking about the Shia crescent from Iran, Iraq through Syria and Lebanon. That wasn't at the time having that much of an impact on the Arab street. In 2009 there was a, a poll of Sunni Arabs in Sunni Arab states in Egypt and Jordan and Palestine. The three most popular regional figures were Hassan Nasrallah, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and Bashar al-Assad. This was not necessarily translating at the time into sectarianism on the ground. And the fourth factor from the Iraq war was, the, uh, as was mentioned earlier um, by Rafaela, was the rise of jihadism. As he explained, um, up until the 2003 war, jihadism was, did not have any major grounding in the Arab world. That's why it was bottled up in Afghanistan, because there hadn't been the opportunity for them to, for them to move in. There had been an attempt in the Algerian civil war in the 1990s, but by and large, it did not have many takers. And it wasn't until the direct intervention of the United States in Iraq, and then the power vacuum it created in Iraq, that you had the rise of jihadism on Arab soil, which really was a unique phenomenon taking place. So that was the circumstances in which the Syrian civil war broke out. Quite possibly the worst time when a war like this could break out. Now, I would agree completely with the idea that it was um, Bashar al-Assad's regime's violent reaction to what was peaceful demonstrations that created the war. But again, the, the, the war was shaped by this uh, vacuum that had been created by the United States removing from the region and also these other factors such as sectarianism and jihadism playing a role regionally. And I would argue, uh, just as a side point, what you get in that vacuum, the Syrian civil war, is various actors trying to impose their will and try to take advantage of the situation and use the Syrian civil war to further their own regional goals. I would identify six actors. There's the United States itself and its allies in the West. I'm not saying it withdraws completely, but it becomes one actor of many rather than the, the perceived hegemon it had been before. 
Russia is another actor, again, defending its sphere of influence in the form of Syria. You then have Turkey and Qatar, which both see in the Arab Spring, in particular the Syrian civil war, an opportunity to further their own region, their own regional influence, and of course, those regional rivals, Saudi and Iran, that see Syria as a battleground for uh, uh, their regional rivalry. And so, this rivalry, I think, exacerbates trends that are already taking place on the ground and shape the, 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 the shape of the Syrian civil war. And I think they do it in three main ways. Firstly, they add to the weakness and divisions among the rebels themselves. Now, the rebels were already an incredibly difficult starting position. You know, they'd been oppressed, for, there'd been no um, opposition really permitted in Syria for 40 years, uh, and suddenly they're expected to gather around, rally around a flag, and form a coherent uh, rebel movement that could topple Assad in a very short space of time. It was a, it was a, it was a difficult sell in the first place. But the, uh, the role of outside powers played a role in weakening them further. Firstly, it actually uh, contributed to pushing them I would argue a little bit too quickly towards a confrontational violent strategy away from a peaceful strategy. Now, it's all very well to say, um, you know, people are shooting at you, you should shoot back, and I, I completely understand that, and that's sort of, you know, the, 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 the emotive response to something. But, there was a conscious decision to move from what I would call the Tunisia and Egyptian model, the sort of peaceful protest model, despite being shot at, into the violent Libyan model, that uh, was taken uh, uh, in terms of forming an armed, uh, armed insurrection against Assad. <coughs> and that shift was based on a major false assumption, and it's based on this misperception of the United States' role in the region. It was based on this old presumption that the United States will come in and help us if we form a military group and start taking some territory. And that, I've spoken to Qatari, Saudi, uh, Turkish foreign policy makers, and they all believed that. They all believed that all that was needed was to take some territory, and the same as what happened with Benghazi and Libya would take place. Uh, but it didn't. It, that fundamentally misunderstands why the United States intervened in Libya. They intervened in Libya not because they are trying to change the region in their own image, but because it was doable, it's a small country, six million people, you know, it's an international pariah with no support, unlike, uh, 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 unlike Syria. Uh, they had no major air defences, they had a huge amount of oil that would contribute to rebuilding, the, um, rebuilding it, and uh, there, there are no uh, sectarian divisions that might lead to a civil war, they were wrong about that, there's, there is a civil war in Libya now. And, uh, perhaps most importantly, it's right on Europe's doorstep and they were genuinely worried about a refugee crisis. None of those circumstances existed in Syria. So, speaking to US policymakers, there was never, ever, any serious discussion about a military intervention like that that took place in Libya to take place in Syria. But the misperception of the United States power in the region from the rebels and the, uh, and, and the rebels' allies affected a shift in strategy, which has led to this more violent confrontation and so on. The other thing that, that the uh, external actors have done is contribute to the disunity of the rebels. They backed different groups. So Qatar, Saudi, Turkey, these groups I described before do not have much foreign policy experience in the Middle East. Everything is based on personal relationships, not based on detailed intelligence. So Qatar, which was one of the first to send weapons and arms to rebel groups, took a very laissez-faire approach. We're going to back various different groups, and often you created a situation whereby groups were competing for funds. Well, actually, what you needed to do was to get them all into one single group, one single unified you know, Free Syria army, or whoever it is, to take on Assad. But instead, their inexperience, excuse me, at sort of foreign policy affairs in the region led them down a very, very weak uh, option. You compare it to someone like Iran, that has a lot of experience backing militia. Actually, they have a far more effective method both in Iraq and Syria and in Hezbollah. You may not like it, but they're good at what they do, whereas the Turks and the, uh, uh, and the Saudis and the Qataris don't. The other fact, I'll very quickly wrap, wrap, wrap through the other um, two factors that were affected, though I think we're, we're more aware of this than anything else. Uh, the external actors kept Assad in power. Iran and, and Russia provided huge amounts of uh, credit, importantly, so um, money so they could pay people, weapons, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and UN support in the case of Russia allowing the regime to prop itself up. 
Had they not done so, the regime almost certainly would have collapsed by now. That does not mean the rebels would have won. I actually don't think they would have done. But I think we would have seen some kind of internal collapse in Syria, either an internal coup or just sort of like the dissolution of the state. So Iran and Russia, again, external actors shaping the, the course of the war, keeping the regime afloat. The final issue that, they've, that the role they've played is uh, promoting sectarianism. Again, sectarianism, I believe, comes primarily from the Assad regime. They've promoted, uh, deliberately used sectarianism as a, as a tool to scare one side uh, in, into supporting it. But we can't forget the fact that um, uh, Iran has used sectarian militia, such as um, Hezbollah and Iraqi militia, uh, on the ground, which has added to the sectarian issue. Saudi, Qatar, and the Gulf states have allowed funds to go to some quite radical militia as well. Um, only last, it was only earlier this year they stopped uh, quite a lot of radical preachers sending uh, funds to radical groups. Um, and of course, again, in, in their media, a lot of them have used sectarian uh, slogans. I was appalled to see an Al Jazeera broadcast last year that had an online poll saying, you know, who is most responsible for the Syrian civil war, the Sunni or the Shia? The very idea that one group could be responsible for a whole complex conflict. So I'm going to leave things there now because I'm having a paper that way badly. I won't talk about uh, now about sort of where this leads us. I actually hope one of my colleagues might be able to talk about that, or we'll be able to talk about it in the uh, in the Q and A session. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so um, I'm going to try and address the difficult question, which is what the international community should do. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have any positive, brilliant solutions that no one's, come, no one's thought of before. Actually, my, my talk's been quite negative, really. So, um, the best way of thinking this issue, I think, is to frame it in terms of the responsibility to protect doctrine, commonly referred to the, as the R2P. Indeed, this is the way that the... Um, what the international communities do, do the, the way that the reaction is commonly being framed in the public, academic debates, and some of the practitioner debates as well. Let me give you a bit of background. So what is the responsibility to protect? What is the RTP? In short, it's the notion that states cannot do what they want to their own populations. They need to uphold their citizens' basic human rights, and in particular, ensure that they're not subject to mass atrocities. States on the RTP have the primary responsibility to look after their populations. But if states are failing in that responsibility, when they're una manifestly unable or unwilling to do so, the responsibility then falls to the international community. The international community, under the authority of the UN Security Council, has got a variety of measures to take on this responsibility, including, but not only, military intervention that we saw in Libya in 2011. So why should we endorse the RTP, the Responsibility to Protect? Well, I think there are clear ethical reasons for endorsing something like this International Responsibility to Protect. Most obviously, states should be held accountable for looking after their citizens, but they should be seen, they should be seen as the primary agents for doing so. In addition, the international community, I think, has a moral duty to react when states are manifestly failing to do so. And this duty stems from a variety of bases, including that we're all part of the same global political economic system, that international crises can, can in turn cause harm to our own civilians, and in turn, just simply that we should try and help people in dire need. Now a little bit more background before I, before I turn to applying this to Syria. So now it's important, it's important to note that I think the RTP has agreed something like universal acceptance. At the 2005 UN World Summit, um, which was a big meeting of, of the General Assembly, the 160 or so heads of state agreed to the notion of responsibility to protect. They agreed more specifically that each state has responsibility to protect its populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. They said a bit later on that we are, in, in, to quote the, the outcome document, we are prepared to take collective action in a timely, decisive manner through the Security Council uh, on a case by case, case basis. Um, where peaceful means are inadequate and national authorities will be manifestly failing to protect their populations from war crimes, ethnic cleansing, genocide, and crimes against humanity. So the RTP is an important development then in the related doctrine of humanitarian intervention, which never had such a clear endorsement. Indeed, some of the RTP advocates have said that this is the most significant normative development of our time, um, comparable to the Nuremberg trials and the 1948 Convention on Genocide. 
Now, one last bit of background before I turn directly to Syria. The RTP is three, three pillars. The first pillar concerns the protection responsibilities of states. So it's widely established that states are legally obliged to look after their own citizens. The second pillar concerns international assistance and capacity building. Basically, when states are fulfilling, struggling to look after their own citizens, they can request assistance from the international community to help them do so. <coughs> and the third pillar concerns timely and decisive response. And this is more coercive. When states are not willing to be helped, and that, this is when action by the international community is actually required, coercive action. We saw this in the case of Libya. So how is this relevant for Syria? Well, most obviously, the Syrian government has a responsibility to protect its population under Pillar 1, which it patently hasn't been doing so. In the December 2013, the then UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Nami Pile, noted that there was massive evidence of serious crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, which were authorised at the very highest level, including by the head of state. The international community therefore has this fallback remedial responsibility to react. It's got the responsibility to make a timely, decisive response. But I think it's very clearly failed in this regard as well. Um, and some of the things that Chris has been discussing about shows how it's been failing. <coughs> what, what should the international community have done? What should it actually do? For some, the RTP just means military intervention. But as I've already said, this isn't quite true. The RTP involves a range of options from dip diplomatic sanctions criminal tribunals to economic sanctions to occasionally military intervention. But military intervention is only acceptable under the responsibility to protect doctrine when certain conditions are met. Now these conditions draw from um, a, a, a doctrine of thinking called just war theory, which has over the centuries developed a numerous, uh, several principles to guide the conduct of war and the resort to force. Now, despite lots of people disagreeing about what these principles actually should involve, there is kind of a coherence around the core set of principles. Now, the account of responsibility to protect in the 2001 report, the initial report on the responsibility to protect by the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, draws explicitly on these principles. Now, they weren't explicitly stated in the 2005 World Summit Agreement, but they are implicitly there in some of the, some of the things in the World Summit and actually in the international law on resorts of force. So if there's going to be intervention under R2P, it needs to have just cause. So that's intervention is only when manif manif uh, national authorities are manifestly failing to protect their populations from war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing and genocide. Legitimate authority, it must be authorised by the UN Security Council. Right intention, the objectives of the intervention must be limited to those dictated by the UN Security Council mandate. Last resort, prevention should be pursued and peaceful alternatives must be pursued before any coercive action. Means, international humanitarian law should be adhered to. Proportionality, intervention must do more good than harm. So these are six principles that are found in international law, the doctrine of responsibility to protect, that says that this needs to apply before intervention could be justified under R2P. Now I think that this potentially ruled out intervention in Syria in 2013 when it was muted against the Assad regime. Now my main reason for thinking in this is that it wouldn't have had sufficient legal authorization, legal authorization from the UN Security Council. Now this is despite the UK government's legal advice, which I think was blatantly wrong. So the legal advice was this, if action in the Security Council is blocked, the UK would still be permitted under international law to take exceptional measures in order to alleviate the scale of overwhelming humanitarian catastrophe in Syria by deterring and disrupting the further, further use of chemical weapons in the Syrian regime. I'm quoting. Such a legal basis is available under the doctrine of humanitarian intervention and then they go on to list three conditions. Now, like most scholars of humanitarian intervention, RTP, and, and I'd say 90% of international lawyers, people don't think that humanitarian intervention is sufficient precedent to establish um, a, right, a legal right to engage in humanitarian intervention without the authorization of the UN Security Council. And this was a key issue in 2013. Now at the time I thought that this coupled with the 
likely proportionality of potential intervention, I thought it was going to do a lot more harm than good, would have meant that the intervention would have been unjustifiable. Looking back now, I'm perhaps less so sure whether I was right in that judgment. I think that the deterioration of the situation in Syria since might have meant that despite the potential violation of international <coughs> law, it might have actually been better to intervene militarily, but on a much, much larger scale. Okay, what about ISIS and RTP? Um, what has recently been called Operation Inherent Resolve. Now, this is a bit more complex. On the one hand, I think that the strikes in Iraq have a clear legal basis. This is because the Iraqi government has requested them, and so they don't violate the principle of non-intervention. As such, they don't require UN Security Council authorization. To the extent that ISIS have engaged in war crimes and crimes against humanity in Iraq are likely to do so, which I think seems clear, the current international response can be seen as pillar under pillar two of the RTP, international assistance. Whether they are justifiable, of course, and not simply legal, is another matter. Now, to that extent, I think it helps to distinguish between two sorts of strikes that are going on. First, when there's an overwhelming humanitarian imperative to act, such as, I think, in the case of the protection of the Yazidis in Iraq. And second, when there's a strategic case for strikes in order to help defeat ISIS and help the Iraqi government establish something like a monopoly of force. So whereas I think the case of the first is much stronger, given the specific and limited humanitarian needs and the objectives, the case of the latter is much more dubious, given the difficulty of defeating ISIS without a much larger mission that potentially involved Western boots on the ground and potentially many civilian casualties. The strikes against ISIS in Syria also have a questionable moral and also questionable legal basis. Now for one, there's the obvious worry that's been mooted that striking against the Assad, uh, ISIS is going to strengthen the Assad. It's committed, as has been, uh, many of the speakers have mentioned already, uh, committed atrocities on a far larger scale than ISIS. It may also mean that he's going to be less willing to agree to be moved into a diplomatic settlement. And in fact, it's already been reported that the US has been implicitly cooperating with Assad since the strikes against um, ISIS are using Syrian airspace. Um, now, the legal case is tricky. There is a potential justification in international law of collective defense of Iraqi sovereignty against external threats. So it might be legal if the US-led coalition can be claimed to be targeting ISIS in Syria that's threatening the sovereignty of Iraq. But it's unclear to what extent the current strikes against ISIS really do help against the threat to the sovereignty of Iraq. And so without Assad's explicit support for the strikes, it's perhaps questionable whether they're legal and in turn can claim to be under the RTP doctrine, as some people have suggested. It's also obviously unlikely that the West is going to be happy to accept an invitation from Assad which he actually appears willing to give. So what does the RTP require instead be done in Syria? As others have said, I think the focus should be on the conflict, the broader conflict on the Assad, rather than the actual defeating ISIS, destroying ISIS, as Obama has said. Now, one might widely, widely mooted option was to train and arm the Syrian moderates um, and the Kurds in Iraq and Syria. Indeed, the arming of various parties by external actors has become one of the central dynamics of the conflict. So on the one hand, Qatar and Saudi Arabia and others have applied arms to the Free Syrian Army. The UK and France applied it with non-lethal support. The, UK and, uh, the US and Turkey facilitated and coordinated the supply. On the other hand, Russia and Iran supplied weapons such as missile systems, mortars and rockets to the Assad regime. In 2012, it was reported um, on Newsnight that the UK even secretly drew up plans to train and equip a 100,000 strong civilian rebel army abroad, which would then strike in a manner similar to the awe and shock strikes on Iraq in 20, 2003. And in 20, September 2014, the US Congress approved, this, yeah, uh, approved Obama's plan to train and equip the moderate Syrian rebel groups. Now, although I think it may sometimes be permissible to arm rebel groups in general, I don't think that fact should blind us to the general problems with arming rebel groups. From what we know from the history of doing so throughout the Reagan Doctrine, during the Cold War and beyond. Whether these apply to Syria, time will tell, but I think that gives us good reason to be highly sceptical about arming rebel groups.
First, it can be difficult to determine who exactly it is that you're arming and whether they're going to be any potentially better than the opposing forces. It, second, we, need to know, we know that supplying arms can often escalate conflicts. Indeed, it is widely reported that um, uh, arms were supplied, as were already mentioned, to the Assad regime by Russia in response. More generally, in the 114 civil wars between 1946 and 2002, where there were 900 people killed, it was, there's been studies to show that no rebel group has transferred major conventional weapons unless the government also received them. So if we transfer arms to the rebel groups, it's very likely that someone will transfer arms on the other side and escalate the conflict. Third, even if weapons are successfully transferred, and you can work out who the just rebel groups are, who the right people are to be transferring them, they may in turn become seized as just rebels lose battles and their stockpiles are raided. And it's already been reported that ISIS is using American weapons captured by the, from the Iraqi government, no, Iraqi army. So my point is that scepticism that we have around military intervention should also apply to supplying arms to rebel groups as well. Now, so what should be done? What, what should be done? Well, ultimately, I don't think there is really any panacea. Um, military action, whether the strikes from ISIS against Assad or to fund rebels, are not traditional, I don't think they're going to be part of the RTP in this case. Well, what does the RTP require instead then? Well, it could require a referral to the International Criminal Court of Assad, but other actors are highly likely to block this, as we've already seen with the case of Russia and China vetoing UN Security Council resolutions. It could launch economic sanctions, but these are likely to have limited efficacy. <coughs> the only game I'm in town, I think, in lots of the more less headline grabbing uh, measures, some of which have already been mentioned, such as improving humanitarian access accepting more refugees and diplomatic pressure. Ultimately, I think that the diplomatic solution, a political one, is the only way that we're going to be able to resolve this situation. And rather than to seek a military one, we should find, try and find a political one. Okay, thank you. In fact, two very strong um, reality checks, I would say, in many senses. And as I'm suspecting, you might counter some of these uh, views. Do you want to speak from here? Do you want to speak? Uh... Okay. Okay, first of all, let me thank the Greek uh, and Liberal Society for, this, for, the, for convening this rather important conference. Um, I would like also to thank the first panel. I think they have given us a lot of important information and thoughts. Um, it is rather important for us to understand the root causes of the problem in Syria. I think even many researchers that I met and discussed, I find that they don't really understand these root causes. I think the lack of freedom and the methodical attempts to deny people dignity are the root causes of the Syrian revolution human rights abuses, poverty, lack of justice, political prisoners, absence of democracy, corruption, all of these are symptoms of the root cause, symptoms of the problem. So when people, when the Syrian people started one of the greatest revolution in recent history in 2011, they were really going for a political change in Syria, because the real issue was a political issue. And as you know, political change in time requires a political solution, especially if it goes through a military conflict. <coughs> During the first six months of the revolution, the regime had a golden opportunity to propose some kind of a political solution or some kind of a solution. It was much easier at the time. But the regime did not do that. Why? For two reasons. First, because of the nature of the regime. It's inherently weak. Tyrannical, dictatorial regime cannot 
propose uh, compromises. They cannot live with compromises. Second reason, a huge pressure from the outside, especially from Iran, on the regime not to give in and not to, pro you know, to propose any solution. However, the perception at the time was a big dilemma to the regime because the whole world could see peaceful demonstrators, human rights activists, political activists are leading an unbalanced struggle against a dictatorial regime. This, this perception is very strong and very important and very powerful to our people. So the strategists within the regime straight away started thinking about that and saying the first thing that we need to do is to change that perception from that it is a struggle between the people and a dictator into something else, into a struggle between state and terrorists. And if you look through the whole time from March 2011 until now, you could see how this perception has changed. So instead, the regime carried on with unprecedented brutality against the civilians and the non-violent struggle people, pushing civilians to take up arms to defend themselves. At the time, we saw that as a major problem because civilians cannot really defend themselves against an army, against the state. How did the international community look at this? Only six weeks after the beginning of the revolution, the American ambassador in Damascus, Robert Ford, sat down with the top leaders of the Syrian opposition. That was on the 30th of April, 2011, only six weeks after the beginning of the revolution. And he focused on two points. And these two points are still valid until now. First of all, he said to us, the revolution is peaceful, keep it that way. If you go for a military revolution, we will not be able to attend the in a military way. And also, we cannot give you the arms that you require to bring down the regime. That was very clear from the beginning. And he said that Syria is not Libya, Syria is different, and we all understand why Syria is different. The geostrategic position of Syria is much different than the rest of the uh, Arab Spring countries. The second point he focused on is that the only solution in Syria is a political solution. We met uh, the American president in May and he said the same and only two weeks ago we met uh, Susan Rice uh, and she said exactly the same. So the Americans have not really changed their mind. Fundamentally their policy is still the same and that is the policy of the international community. So we cannot really pretend that they did not tell us the truth from the beginning. They did, and they were very, very clear about this. Now, I could detect certain hesitation from the Americans and from the international community regarding bringing down the regime from the beginning. Why? Because I believe that they did not think there is a viable alternative or a safe alternative. So, for them, 
there was always this big, big fear that the alternative would be either chaos or fundamentalist regime. And in both cases, it is something that I don't desire. So, the only way for the international community to progress its talk and work on Syria is to explore a political solution. And this happened very clearly after many, many attempts uh, in Geneva communique on the 30th of June 2012. This is very significant. Geneva communique is very significant because it for the first time, it talks about political change in Syria. And it talks about creating a transition governing body that with full executive authority. In a way, even though it does not mention Bashar al-Assad in name, but the meaning of that is that this transition governing body will be a replacement of Bashar al-Assad and his ruling elite. It took us some time to, you know, to convince our people, our fighters, that it is a good idea to explore this opportunity called Geneva. Uh, in 2012, we were, from a, from a military point of view, we were in a better position than now. So as you know, with those kind of situations, people tend to favor the military option more than the political option. But we told them that as far as we can see the situation, the world will not allow one of the two parties to win militarily. So our only option is to go for a political solution. And we managed to convince the majority. Not all of them, but a reasonable majority. And I was one of the negotiating team that went to Geneva, attended the first and the second round of talks. Unfortunately, Geneva process collapsed for two reasons. First, one of the two sponsors of Geneva Communique, namely Russia, changed its mind. And they did not really push for these, co for these talks to be successful. And that was reflected straight away on the attitude of the regime in the negotiation room. <clears throat> Secondly, the regime at the time was in a way making some military gains. And the Syrian regime thought that it can win militarily and it does not have to go through this process. So we lost a very important opportunity uh, in Geneva because I believe that Geneva Communique, in a way, is capturing almost the majority of the objectives of our revolution which is political change. Still, the whole world is not able to restart Geneva talks because of the infighting within the Security Council. And also the lack of agreement among the friends of Syria states. I remember once we had a meeting with the uh, Emirates uh, Foreign Minister, uh, Abdullah bin Zayed, he said to us that the London 11, or what we call Friends of Syria, are agreeing on only one thing, to bring down the regime, but they are not agreed on anything else. So that kind of lack of agreement also was reflecting on the whole situation. The current situation is rather complicated and difficult. I don't think that currently we have 
a reasonable environment for a political solution in Syria. Because both parties, and I am one of the two parties, still believe that we can win it militarily. That's the revolution people and the regime. Also, the international community does not have the political will to push the regime into the negotiating table. And until the international community has that kind of will, I think it will be difficult for negotiation to start. At this moment, we have um, an opportunity. And this is the notion of safe havens, of safe areas in northern Syria. This idea is proposed by Turkey and it's supported by Turkey. And I think it is rather important idea and this is something that can probably start the first step of a real political solution in Syria. There are a lot of negotiations at the moment between Turkey and the United States regarding this, but there are two main important uh, characteristics of this, uh, of this area. First, it will be safe, it will be protected from the air, and secondly, the interim government, the government that we created among the Syrian National Coalition, will be the only executive power in this area. I think this is rather significant. It will take some time. I think it will take three to four months for such idea to materialize. But with the lack of political, you know, political will in the international community and also at the, with the regime side, this is our only option to go for. Um, we hope that by setting up such a safe haven in northern Syria, we can extend it bit by bit until we either take the whole Syrian territory or we can put enough pressure on the regime to sit on the table and accept Geneva communique the same way we did. Thank you. The, um, three uh, fascinating talks there. Um, I just want to pick that point about safe havens. It's in the news quite a bit now. And you, you gave some options um, which clearly would be unacceptable to the regime and to, and to their backers. How much do you also see the concept of safe havens as the beginnings of the de facto partition of the country, in the sense that as a people who have risen up and haven't got the international support that they think they warranted or deserved, uh, that hasn't happened. Well, at least there could be some parts of Syria which are absent from indiscriminate bombing and lay the foundations for increased aid, development, and as you said, the government eventually coming in and setting up institutions, but it actually would be a de facto partition. It wouldn't really uh, be realistic to talk about extending it or, or, or the Geneva, Geneva free happening. Yeah, I, I think at the moment we have a pseudo de facto partition anyway. You have uh, certain areas, more than probably more than 50% of the Syrian territories are not under the control of the Syrian regime. So we have that kind of partition. Uh, but it's not uh, formal, it's not something that we aspire for. Uh, I don't think either side would like to see Syria uh, partitioned. Uh, we have, of course, some, you know, some voices here and there, but the, 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 the real political will uh, among the Syrian people is to keep Syria as, as one state. And also, it is clearly the will of the international community uh, as well. Uh, so. You know, I'm not 
afraid about that. I think this will not create a partition. To the contrary, it will start the first step of reclaiming uh, okay. a future Syria, a future democratic Syria. Okay. Okay. Um, so we've got 20 <coughs> minutes or so, I think, 20 minutes or so to, to delve into these issues in a bit more. Uh, I'm going to take three questions initially again. So uh, the, the lady up there, uh, you sir as well, and in the blue top. Yeah, and we'll come back to we'll come back to everybody else afterwards. And if you again like you want to say who you are, if you work for anybody and who your question is directed at, that would be appreciated. Okay, it's Dr. Shamila who spoke earlier on. My question is for the um, uh, the middle guest. You said intervention should do more good than harm um, when obviously considering airstrikes. Um, and clearly, in uh, as we've seen in the past in Iraq and Afghanistan, that hasn't happened. Um, the legality of airstrikes in Syria based on ISIS being in Iraq and in Syria. Um, how do you explain that the, um, some of the airstrikes inside northern Syria have, um, from the US-led airstrikes, have hit targets that have nothing to do with Syria, uh, with ISIS? That's my question. Okay. There's a chap here, Jackie, put your hand up, yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Abdelaziz, as just a question, we are going international everything, but I want to go home here. Uh, what do you think about the British government policy in Syria? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And if you, if you leave your hand up in the blue jacket, yeah. Um, thank you all for your wonderful presentation. It's a very quick question to Anas, if I may. Um, what makes you so confident that the Syrian National Coalition is going to have any traction inside Syria? Why, why would anybody, any of the groups, any of the plurality of groups that are fighting for their very survival and the survival of the Syrian people recognize an interim government outside of the country? So how much traction, how much influence do you have inside Syria? Okay. Good, diverse questions there. Let's go back to that first one then around uh, intervention, hitting non-ISIS groups like Joe Thunders. So I think potentially on the occasion there might be particular strikes might do some more good than harm. So I think in terms of that, starting to talk about trying to distinguish between those that have got kind of clear humanitarian um, objectives. But I actually think that Beyond, beyond particular strikes, there are broader worries with undermining international law, the present effect that they can have, and that could actually weaken the international system in the future. Uh, I mean, it, it kind of make it easier for the US or others to intervene and potentially have negative humanitarian consequences elsewhere. So I think we need to be, in terms of doing more good than harm, it's not just the immediate situation that you need to take into account, it's the broader uh, international background that you need to take into account as well. And so that's why I think there needs to be an overwhelming humanitarian need in the strikes. Can I clarify? So the whole question about UK government policy regarding Syria, are you talking about UK government policy within the UK or within Syria and the wider region? No, I think what is the position? The position, you know, British policy, the same government, uh, independent government, the United Nations, we are actually okay. a member of the uh, what do they want United, to see? What do they want United to see? Security Council. Okay. Okay. You talk about Russia, you talked about uh, the USA. Okay. Are we the USA? Let me let me bring Chris on that in and out of Whitehall or Westminster. Yeah, okay. I mean well it's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I think unfortunately the, the, the response is gonna disappoint us all, which is that Britain is nowhere near as powerful as we think we are. Um, have, they have a position on the Security Council, but almost always follow the United States and France and the collective on most of those issues, especially on sensitive issues like, like the Middle East, with the exception of Israel Palestine, which has got its own sort of a, uh, uh, its own sort of a dimension. So what the, the British policy is officially is, is the same as the United States and the European Union, which is that uh, we uh, would we, sorry, I always tell my students off for saying that, <laughs> Britain, uh, 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 you know, Britain uh, you know, calls for uh, uh, the Assad, Assad to stand down, uh, it supports Geneva 2 and the Geneva, Geneva communique, it um, 
recognises the uh, Syrian National Council as the legitimate representative of the Syrian people, I believe, but they're very cautious to not grant them the same kind of recognition that they gave um, the, uh, what the LTC in Libya, which was the, the legitimate representative of Libya. So, so they made a very distinction, but they are not recognising them as the government in exile, so that's sort of a key position. The, the, effectively, what um, the British sort of behind the scenes move is, is to spend a lot of time at the UN to try to push through things like humanitarian issues and so on, knowing full well that deep down, if the United States doesn't budge on more intervention, then there's nothing they can do about it. Cameron, early on in the, in the crisis, was one of the big you know, drum beaters for more direct intervention, uh, to which Barack Obama said, absolutely no, not a chance, not going to happen. Indeed, um, remember, Cameron was one of the leaders with Sarkozy in really pushing for intervention in Libya, so he felt he'd got a kind of a track record on that point. These days, the British government spend a lot more time focusing on the refugee issue. They're one of the largest contributors to aid to uh, uh, UNHCR's budget, uh, which incidentally is massively unfunded at the moment. And uh, recently, the same, the same month that uh, we uh, announced, we, Britain, uh, uh, voted uh, to bomb ISIS, uh, the World Food Programme uh, announced that it was so underfunded it's had to cut food to Syrian refugees by 60 or 50 percent. Uh, depending. Uh, some people are now down to 825 calories a day, which is disgraceful. Um, the other thing that the British aren't doing, which is very noticeable, which was mentioned earlier uh, um, uh, by Christian, is not accepting uh, refugees into the UK itself. And compared to something like Germany and Sweden, which have taken between 10 and 20,000, uh, the Brit British numbers of 100,000 is really you know, quite appalling, so Britain should be doing more on that. I do want to just add a tiny point, and add a point about, about the, the safe havens idea, which is that I, I understand the logic behind them and so on, and why people are pushing for them. I, I think they're quite unlikely still, though. And the reason being is that, effectively, if the, the Turks are not willing to do them on their own. They're, they absolutely require the United States or NATO to do them on their behalf. The United States has been very, very reluctant to, to initiate a no-fly zone for the whole of this uh, conflict, which is what a safe haven ba ba basically is, because it requires uh, risking American lives taking out serious defences. It um, will hugely um, upset and worry both the Russians and the Iranians, because it will be seen as a violation of Syrian sovereignty, which they're trying to defend, uh, and they might react as a consequence. And importantly, when it comes to you know, um, the, the, the Turkish issue, is where do you put this, no this, this um, safe haven? Do you only put it in basically Syrian Arab areas, which are sort of where the, the, um, you know, the SNC would, would, would rule? What about the Kurdish areas? If the United States are going to come on board with this idea, basically Congress loves the Kurds and is terrified of the Syrian Arabs believing that they're sort of like going to all turn to Jihad al Nusra and ISIS. So they would only agree to something, I don't think they would, but, but if they did, that included someone like Kobani, and the Turks would never agree to that. So you have that sort of dynamic there that, that makes something like that. I mean, again, I might be wrong, they might find a way through that. That's a major sticking point um, to get over. Get, get yeah, and this, I mean, thankless task, whatever country you're in, being a politician, uh, and, you know, I have some sympathy for some of the Syrian Opposition Coalition uh, politicians, they do get berated a lot. But it is a legitimate question as well, about traction within the country itself, and the diaspora, actually. Yeah, I mean... Uh, you know, I, I think your question is extremely valid and I think there are a lot of challenges for the interim government and for the Syrian National Coalition. As you know, the, the Syrian revolution started in a peaceful way and from the beginning we had a decentralized leadership. And at the time that was a point of strength because when you face a dictatorship with a decentralized leadership, you are able to continue with this fight. However, when the uh, nature of the conflict moved into a military war, this decentralized leadership started to be a weak point rather than a strength point. And we see uh, a lot of that in the areas that are liberated by the, the, uh, the rebels. To the point that I think, you know, maybe we got the Guinness Book of records in terms of the number of uh, brigades, uh, more than a thousand in, in, across Syria, uh, of, with official, you know, names and people and stuff like that. Some of them might be like 50 or less, but still they recognize themselves as a separate brigade. So it is a huge challenge and it's a, a huge uh, problem 
Uh, however, people started also to realize that things cannot carry on like this. Almost half of the population is displaced, both internally and outside. It is a real earthquake that happened, you know. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of the infrastructure of the homes have been demolished. We, yeah, I think even ourselves, we don't realize what really happened until now. And people, if, if war stops now, I think we will, even Syrians will be extremely shocked at what happened since March 2011. So people started to be much more realistic about the fact that we need some kind of a solution, but we also need the help of our friends, because you cannot as a civilian, as, as rebel groups with minimum level of, 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 of uh, weapons face state like the regime with airplanes, tanks and, and, you know, and uh, non-conventional weapons. So we have an opportunity and, and we are going to try our best to do the best. In the past, <coughs> so during the last 11 months, I think the interim government was more like a government in exile rather than government inside Syria. And I think the challenge now for the new Prime Minister, Dr. Ahmad Toma, is to make sure that we move from that type into a revolutionary interim government inside Syria uh, with, the, with, the, with all that is required to do that. I guess one of the difficulties as well is within Syria, whether from a regime position or any of the, the many uh, opposition formations, there is no credible internationally recognized system to assessing legitimacy, referendums, elections. There's never, I've never heard any talk of UN Electoral Assistance Division uh, being called on. I mean, there's endpoints of the Geneva, Pro Geneva Communique, which talks about a, a political transition with credible elections, what have you, but it's, it never really, really talked up in any realistic sense from any of the other. Uh, from the coalition or any of the other formations, which is an interesting uh, point, I think. Um, we have some time for some more questions. Um, uh, okay, there was the chap next to the guy in the blue. Uh, why have only men got their hands up? There's a meal going on. Um, chap up here in the black jacket. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm here, here as well, on the right track as well. And keep your questions quite brief as well so we can get some more full answers. Uh, thank you, thank you for the analysis and we've heard a bit of a solution. Uh, my question is going to try and link the analysis to the solution. The analysis said that the Americans are not as powerful as they were um, and it's only in the, perhaps in the Sunni world that they're perceived as being powerful. The solution said, we want a political solution, but you're all talking to the Americans <laughs> and the West. It's quite obvious that the only people who have power over Assad are the Iranians. And the Iranians are the regional power. Isn't it time that we buried this hatred between Sunnis and hatred coming from the Shias as well, it's on both sides, and maybe you should go to Tehran. You should not be in Washington. Try going to speak to Khamenei. Uh, after all, you know, uh, they have a strategic interest in the 80s. <coughs> Assad's father tried to crush his bullah. Okay, the point And uh, they were at the Ayatollah Khomeini who told him to stop, and that's what stopped it. So maybe we're looking in the wrong direction for okay. the Okay, should Iran be involved in political, uh, on a political track? Sure. Uh, in formal sense. There's a question uh, here as well. The black, just wait for the microphone to come around as well. Okay. Should, should oh, you can't there. Yeah. Okay, go for it. My, my question is not too distant from Jangir's actually, um, so I won't try and repeat what he's actually said. But in the earlier session, Asim touched upon the fact that almost eventually you have to have a dialogue with everybody. And my point really is this, um, which is uh, a, a question really for you, uh, Ernest, which is, is, do you have a channel of dialogue both with ISIS and other factions and also the Assad regime? Um, or are you exploring to ensure that there is some kind of channel of dialogue both 
that direct, in both those directions. And quickly, just a quick second question, which is, do you believe the SNC's influence has waned somewhat as a result of the change of political dynamic from what was in the early part of the conflict and what is now? Thank you. Very good, very good question. And chap over here, just put your hand up, yeah. Uh, my question is to Mr. Jefferson. I really enjoyed uh, what you said. I think you made some good points. If you use the microphone, yeah. Yeah, even though know, I don't really agree with you, but there's something I wanted to ask you as well. You were talking about the uh, intervention in Iraq and against uh, ISIS and Iraq as well. But something you mentioned was that the difference between Syria and Iraq was that the Iraqi government would be just nuts. I'm going to have to call you out on that one because at the end of the day, uh, the Iraqi government only came into place after, after the 2003 invasion, which itself was illegal. And the Iraqi government is seen as being completely sectarian, the same way the Syrian government is seen. So, how can we see the Iraqi government as being legitimate and mindful of partners, the same way that we can't see the Assad government as being part as well? Excellent. Can I, so let, let's, th those first two questions, let's combine them together for Anas around if there is the potential for a Geneva 3 or the, the sort of confidence building discussions that might lead into Geneva 3, how willing uh, your coalition would be to um, directly engage and, and call on the Americans and, uh, to say, look, Iran should be there? Iran. Iran. Yeah. You, you've accepted that you're going to sit opposite from uh, the Assad regime. Uh, absolutely. Um, to be honest, uh, I, I still remember very clearly um, we asked the United Nations to revoke its invitation to Iran to attend Geneva II in Montreux for one simple reason, that they did not accept Geneva communique. All the people who attended the conference, including the Russians, the Chinese, uh, the international community, uh, the Arab nations, all of them accepted Geneva communique. And we said to the UN very clearly that if Iran is there, we are not attending because they do not accept Geneva communique. What is the purpose of inviting them? We have to have a common ground in order to achieve a solution. And I think it was the first time in the history of the UN that an, an official invitation was revoked because the Iranian would not, uh, uh, you know, would not accept Geneva communique. I am with you. I, I think Iran is part of the problem. It could be part of the solution, but they have to agree to some kind of a common ground in order for us to be able to talk and to come to a, some kind of a solution. And at this moment of time, the internationally agreed formula is Geneva communique. This is accepted by even the friends of the Syrian regime. But still Iran refuses to do so. I think if Iran changes its mind and starts to really approach this situation in a more positive way, first by stopping sending all its militias, sectarian militias, all its top generals to help Bashar al-Assad killed the Syrian people, and secondly, accept Geneva communique, I think we have no problem. I mean, we sat down with the regime in Geneva, who is doing these barbaric uh, crimes. But for one reason, because the regime, apparently, superficially, accepted Geneva communique. So there was at least something to talk to the, with the regime about. Iran, up till this moment of time, still insisting on not recognizing Geneva communique. I'm going to bring the other two panelists on this one, but I just wanted to just clarify points, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it might be a provocative thing to say this, but do you think that maybe Iran were just actually being more honest than, say, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, who yesterday on the surface accepted Geneva communique, but haven't exactly done anything to fulfill getting to the Geneva communique in any serious way? Possibly, possibly because the concept of uh, stabilization towards democratization and participation and equality and what have you is actually a threat to their model as well, their model of government, government and governmentality. Well, what we saw from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar, uh, is a lot of support and honest support for us 
both politically and uh, militarily as well. And when it came to Geneva Communique, they really, really tried to convince us to go for this kind of political solution. And they were not doing it uh, in, in a way just to look if they are honest. They were really genuine uh, in this because the Syrian situation is a problem not only to Syrians, but to everybody. It was starting to spill out of Syria and at the time, and until now, the Arab countries are really, really interested in, in, in fixing the, uh, this problem. Okay, we from James and I guess you're quite firm in your belief that political solution needs to be the way forward. Bringing in Iran, bringing in wider non-state actors, in the last panel we talked about ISIS could be negotiated with. If there is to be another uh, dip diplomatic round, so-called Geneva III, which looks very unlikely at the moment, is that the way to go, to bring in more voices, more regional voices? Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how much ISIS can be negotiated with. I mean, like, it's something that I just don't have the empir empirical knowledge. But I, I mean, as uh, as the speaker uh, yeah. said, said earlier, that mm. everyone can be negotiated with, and mm. I think this is the only realistic solution. Otherwise, mm. things will just go on and on until mm. more and more people will die. Mm. So, I mean, and Chris, I'm guessing you're broadly towards the diplomatic track. It's called Petraia, which is what sending more weapons in on one side or the other is. You need to look at other examples of successful conflict resolution places like Bosnia. And the first thing that they did there to actually start to bring in, uh, to actually make the conflict end, was to get an international agreement of all the players uh, in the conflict to stop supplying weapons to, 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 to the major players. No one's done that yet. There is not an appetite. I mean, actually, I, I would actually add to my sort of my, the, the point before you said that sort of, the, you interpreted what I said as the US is less powerful and Iran is more powerful. Iran is actually no more powerful than the other actors. That's one of the, the, the great tragedies of the Syria crisis, is that with the withdrawal of the United States dominance of the region, means you've got lots of actors of, of about e equal measure. All of them are able to create problems, but very few of them are actually I, pa powerful enough to I, implement I, a solution. I disagree. Okay. I disagree. Sure, sure. Let, 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 so hold on, hold on, because we need to we need to wrap up fairly soon. And I think you know what's been said there. I mean, even the indication of a political solution is is troubling to a lot of uh, Syrians who support uh, the overthrow of the Assad regime. I mean, I think that's understandable. Um, I don't think we're going to solve that <laughs> that, that issue uh, here tonight. But it's it's been fascinating, and there's a lot of food for thought in terms of where that political track could go, and actually how much uh, force is an element in that, because you know, as I was saying in wrapping up my piece, you can't do any of this if you don't have security on the ground. The question is, who's going to provide the security? Is it going to be uh, states? Is it going to be a boosted up, more coordinated uh, armed opposition with a political wing? Is it going to be a third party, an impartial party? Is it going to be the UN, for instance? Those are conversations that need to uh, still be discussed. Uh, but it's been fascinating. If you give the panel a round of applause and then we're going to give a bar. Thank you very much.